Hi, my name is John Cullen. I'm one of the pastors here at Southbridge. Thank you so much for checking out our sermons online. Our prayer is that you are challenged by the Word of God and grow in your affections for Christ. We recognize that this can be a great supplement to your personal study, or maybe you simply could not make it to church this week. Our hope, though, is that you're plugged into a local community of faith. So if you live in the Raleigh-Durham area and looking for a church, we would love to meet you on a Sunday and help you get connected. If you are not local, we want to encourage you to find a gospel-centered church in your area. Thank you again for letting us be a part of your week. Enjoy the word of God proclaimed. As we dive in this morning, would you go to the Lord in prayer? Let's just ask him to meet us in this place this morning. Father, we are grateful for your love, for your goodness, for your mercy. We're thankful for Jesus who brings life change and transformation. Lord, you are a good and a gracious God. And we just ask you to meet us in this place this morning. Speak to us, Father, through the truth of your word as only you can through the power and presence of your Holy Spirit. For it's in his name we pray together. Amen. Well, I trust you have a copy of God's word this morning. In just a few moments, we're going to Luke chapter 2. You've probably been there quite a bit this year through Christmas. Uh, But we're going to finish out the chapter as we start this new year because I believe that Luke is teaching us some things about what it means to grow in Christ and what it means to, to live for him as demonstrated in the life of Jesus, the early life of Jesus. Now, Luke is the only one that actually gives us some of the picture of the early days of Jesus' childhood. Matthew gives us a little glimpse into the the family fleeing to Egypt and coming back. But Luke gives us a little different perspective, and I think we're going to learn some things as we press in there. Uh, But as we begin this morning, I want to lay a little bit of foundation, maybe kind of set the stage, because I'm not sure if you have caught it at all over this last month. uh, We've been going through a series called Anticipating Christmas. Does anyone know the subtitle of our series? Okay, Andrew, make a note. Our graphics just aren't that captivating, I guess, that, that draws you in, right? Anticipating Christmas. It was subtitled, Waiting for More. Oh, yes, you know, everybody's, oh, yeah, yeah I, I knew that. If it were a multiple choice test, you'd have probably passed, right? <clears throat> Waiting for more, because kind of the last couple of years, there, there's been some uncertainty and all kinds of things, and, and in so many ways, we're all just waiting for more. We're waiting for, for normal, or we're waiting for, you know, those times we can regather or something. But this morning, as, as I have looked at Luke chapter 2, I think there's a point in our Christian journey that we don't simply wait for more, but we step out by faith to become more. Jesus did it. We're going to see it in the, in the picture that, that Luke paints for us this morning. But as we start this new year, some of you may be the type that, that writes out New Year's resolutions, and you, you've probably crossed off that list and thrown it away already because that's what we do, right? We make this great list, and then we, we cross it off by January 2nd, 3rd. Um, but I want us to make a commitment together as a church to strive to become more, to become the church that God is calling us to be. And so we're, we're going to look at Luke chapter 2. And, and to kind of set this up, you've heard, if you've been around Southbridge at all, you, you've heard us say we are passionate about what? Connecting people to Jesus for life change. A connection simply means to, to, to enter into relationship. So when we talk about connecting to Jesus, it means entering into relationship. When we talk about getting connected in the small group, it means you're, you're entering into relationship with other people uh, to help one another grow spiritually. Uh, you're making a commitment to one another. And, but here's what I want you to understand. We are passionate about connecting people to Jesus for life change. That, that's our mission as a church. But, but here's the problem. We can only be passionate as a church if we individually are passionate, right? If we're going to be passionate as a church, it means that individually, each of us is passionate about connecting people to Jesus. Are you? Now I'm meddling, right? <laughs> Now, now I'm meddling. But, but there's this reality, right, that, that we can only be passionate if each of us is passionate. And now, now we believe as a church that God has given us a unique mission. Um, and, and we take that mission really serious. 
Our desire is, is to be what Jesus showed us. We want to be the church that God commanded us to be, what he demonstrated for us. And that is that we want to be the a people who train up and equip one another to spiritual maturity in Christ. So I'll just ask you as we begin this new year, is that why you're here? Now, I'll just be honest, online or in the room, we're all here for a lot of different reasons. And, and I just want to say thank you for being here. Uh, some of you, either in the room or online, you may be searching. You, there may be struggles. There may be problems. You're looking for answers to really difficult situations in life. I want you to know that Jesus has an answer, that his word has an answer. Uh, you may be here simply because you kind of like people, you know, uh, and you want to belong to something. Uh, or maybe you're here out of tradition. I kind of went through that for a long time in my life. I mean, as a young kid, I had a drug problem. You know, I was drugged to church every time the doors were open. And, you know, it was just, and, and so as I got a little older out on my own, it's like all of a sudden I have to make a choice. Do I keep doing this? And I did for a while, not necessarily because I was passionate about it, but because it's what you do. It's what I did growing up. And then there came a point that it's like, okay, I have to get serious about this. Am I really serious about it? And so some of you may be out of tradition. Um, some just, you want to belong to something. Some of you are truly passionate and, and you're growing and you're going, I want to connect to the mission. I believe that God has a purpose for my life and I want to commit to that. So uh, no matter where you are or why you're here, thank you for being here. And I truly believe that God is going to meet you at the very point of your need. And he's going to teach you. He's going to instruct you. So just lean into him this morning and trust him. Now, I will say that over the last couple of years, our elders and our leadership have been praying and working very diligently on what the future of Southbridge looks like. And you're going to hear more about that from Pastor Scott moving into this year as we move forward. Um, but as, as the elders have been praying diligently, working through a 10-year vision plan, right, what does that look like? Um, one of the things that we've discovered is that we believe... That, that Southbridge is unique. We believe that God has a unique call on our life and we wanna make sure that we do it the way he wants us to do it and not just the way culture tells us to do it. And, and so you're gonna learn more about a discipleship pathway that we're gonna kinda hold as a standard, a banner to kinda put in front of people to go, this is where we're all going. We're all moving in this direction. Now, not at the same rate, not at the same pace because we're different people, right? But, but this is our objective, this is our goal. As we connect people to Jesus for life change, this is our goal, this is our destination. And so you're gonna hear more about that. But I think we see some of that here in Luke chapter two. And so I wanna sort of set the stage for this new year as we move forward just a little bit. And, and Luke gives us not, not an in-depth look at the life of Jesus as a child, but he gives us little snapshots. And we could really press into this text. We're not going to take the time to do that. But I want to share with you these snapshots that Luke gives us. And the first one, we're all very, very aware. And that is the snapshot of Jesus the infant. Jesus the infant. You can follow along if you have a small group study guide or if you're online or grab your phone. Just go to sfchurch.com right now. And you can actually download. You can grab this small group study guide. I'm going to walk through the outline that's here. And at the close, I'm going to walk through a series of questions that are on there to help us each as we move forward in this new year. But the first snapshot that, that Luke gives us is of Jesus, the infant. Now, we're all familiar with the Christmas story, right? We've just lived it. We've just been there. We, we've heard it for several weeks. We heard it on Christmas Eve. We heard it last Sunday as Pastor Scott, Pastor Brad at different moments read through Luke chapter 2. And from verses 1 through 20, we get the, the Christmas narrative. And really back into Luke chapter 1 as Mary encounters the angel Gabriel. And, and so we, we have that whole story laid out. But, but I want to share a couple of things with you because we're familiar with the story. But I have always loved one great little phrase in the midst of the, of the Christmas narrative that we often either miss or we just don't stop and dwell there enough. And so I want this to kind of be the foundation for our time together this morning. And it's found in Luke chapter 2 in verse 19. I love what Luke records. In the midst of Jesus' birth and, and the shepherds coming to the, to the stable to, to meet the baby Jesus as they had been instructed, we have these words from Luke. And he simply says, but Mary 
treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. Have you ever caught that phrase before in the Christmas story? Mary treasured all these things. All what things? And she pondered them in her heart. What, what, what is he saying? Well, I love this because when you break down the, the words that Luke is using, the word treasured literally means to preserve or, or to guard or, or to keep watch. And, and to, to ponder literally is to, to bring them together, kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. Maybe you spent time as a family and maybe you worked on a puzzle over the, over the holidays. So what is Luke saying? Luke is saying that, that Mary has taken all these things, all these memories, all these activities, all the things that took place, and, and she's preserving them. She's keeping watch over them. She's guarding them, and she's trying to fit it all together like a jigsaw puzzle. So that begs the question of me when I study God's Word, what is she treasuring? What is she trying to put together? And so, over the, the course of Christmas, um, I, I kind of read through the, the gospel accounts uh, of Jesus' birth and, and the nativity story, and I, I sort of just threw down a list of things that I think were taking place. So, let me, let me run this list for you because I think this is part of what measure, Mary is treasuring. Uh, are you ready? Yes. Are the rest of you ready? Great. Okay, so what is it that Mary is treasuring and pondering? Well, first off, get this. An angel of the Lord appears to her. Anyone else kind of find that a little strange? Anyone else have that encounter? So Gabriel appears to Mary. There's something to treasure there. There's something to guard. She had a visit then with her cousin Elizabeth, who affirmed her calling, called her blessed, called her chosen by God. An angel then appears to Joseph and affirms the call of God on their lives together. I just want you to stop and imagine for a moment of the conversations that are taking place between Mary and Joseph. Everything rosy? Everything wonderful? She's, she's treasuring these things. She, she's pondering. She's trying to fit it all together. What, what, what is this? The Holy Spirit of God comes upon Mary, a virgin, and becomes pregnant knowing she is carrying the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. That's a lot to take in. She wonders of the possible disgrace and, and the separation from the man that she loves. She's wondering about being ostracized from her family, her friends, her society, because seriously, who's going to believe this story? For this young girl, probably 14, 15 years old. She has to wrestle with the possibility of, of what, what that means to society and what her life is now going to look like. She and Joseph kind of have a renewed commitment. I, I sort of see it in the text that, that, that they step out with one another in faith and obedience, trusting the Lord to live in obedience to his commands. Mary's processing all this. There's this crazy and very untimely decree from the governor that there's a census to be taken. So moms, get this. You're pregnant. You're nesting. There's this nesting thing taking place at your home. Now all of a sudden you're uprooted and you have to travel. That sounds exciting, doesn't it? I just painted the nursery. We can't go anywhere now. But what do they do? She makes the long, weary journey about 90 miles from Galilee down to Bethlehem. Potentially taking, get this, anywhere from four to seven days. She's pregnant, so I'm probably going to the later side of that. And as Pastor Scott said, we've sort of sanitized the story. We don't know if she rode a donkey. It looks great in the flannel graphs in Sunday school, but we don't know. There's a good chance she walked. And, and ladies, I don't know, pregnant, you're probably going to stop and take some breaks, right? But she's processing all this stuff. She, she's dealing with the struggle. She's feeling as though she's chosen and blessed because that's what Elizabeth affirmed in her. And yet she finds herself being placed in less than pleasant or even sanitary accommodations while pregnant and experiencing birth pains. She, she's left having no other obvious choice but to give birth to her precious child alone in a barn, having to use a feeding trough to lay her newborn child. All of a sudden, outside where she is, there's a heavenly host appearing to some outcasts in the field who are keeping watch over their sheep, and these, these angels tell them to go invade her personal space. So they do. And so you have this ragtag, smelly bunch of shepherds showing up, ladies, in the delivery room going, hey, we heard about this baby that you just had. 
Angels go back to heaven uh, and, and the shepherds rejoice. Go, it says that they went off telling everyone they know. Now listen, I don't know about you. I, again, I'm reading into the text. Would that draw attention to them? W would that cause other visitors to come invade their space? Hey, guess who just had a baby? And, and so there's a good chance she's experiencing other visitors coming in. After all the preparation, after all the mayhem, all the adventures in life, Luke simply says, but Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. You ever have a moment like that? God, what are you doing? God, my life is out of control. God, my life looks nothing like I thought it was going to be. I thought this was going to be a straighter road. I thought it was going to be a better path. I thought things were going to be different. And, and we just sort of had that moment of saying, God, what are you doing? And maybe you've had that moment. You've, you've wondered whether God has forgotten you completely. Maybe you felt completely empty. Maybe you forgot abandoned uh, or felt abandoned. Maybe you were kind of wondering, God, how did we get here? Or why did we get here? Why did you bring me to this place? Only to stop and treasure those moments. And as you begin to ponder them and you begin to see the puzzle of life come together, you begin to have this intimate moment with Jesus. And I believe that's exactly what is happening in Mary's life. Because I've been there. I, I know that process where you get to that place and in the quietness after everything else, you simply say, God, after all that we've been through, through all this journey, through all the, the struggles and the questions, I am pondering your works. I, I'm pondering your, your wondrous hand, your goodness and your mercy, your faithfulness, your abundant provision for me. The fact that you are a good and a merciful God, a, a God that is true to your word, a God that knows my beginning from my end, that you love me dearly and I am never, ever, ever for a moment out of your thought or out of your sight that you love me so deeply and your plan is always perfect as I walk with you. I believe that's what Mary is doing in this moment. When life makes no sense, God is still at work and he's still faithful and he's trustworthy. Amen? Amen. Folks, I don't know what your last year has been or your last two years or your life, but I believe fully that when we walk in obedience with God's command, treasuring and pondering all that God has taken us through, that we trust him for our future. Now, maybe to treasure and ponder your journey with Jesus, you need to take time to, to develop your personal story. I wanna give you just a fast outline right here in the middle of this to help you do that. Because if, if someone were to approach you today or tomorrow or this week and say, I understand you're a religious person, you go to church, you, you believe in this Jesus, tell me about that. What, what do you tell them? What do you tell them? Three things really fast, and it's on the outline. You can catch it there, but, but just jot this down. And I want you to think as you start into this new year, what is your story with Jesus? And, and think about three different things. My life before Jesus, how I came to know Jesus, and my life since I've come to know Jesus. Think about those three areas and, and start with this, with each of those areas, like my life before Jesus. Begin to think of words, just individual words. That, that kind of represent your life. Aimless, hopeless, helpless, reckless, addiction. I, mean, I, I don't know. But think of habits, think of hangups, think of emotions, things that represented your life. And then begin to think about how you came to know Christ. What, was there a person that was involved? Was there an activity that was involved? Or was there a tragedy in your life that kind of wrecked your life and made you stop and rethink? I, I don't know. What, what, it's your journey, it's your life. And then what has God done in your life since, right? If we're passionate about connecting people to Jesus for life change, we always believe because it's true of God's word, God always brings life change. Always brings life change. So begin just by, by writing words and, and then begin to put those words into a sentence or two. And then put those three areas together. And, and I would really encourage you to invite someone to help you do that. Someone in your small group, contact the church office, contact me, I'd love to sit. I've done this with a lot of people. Just as a starting point, what is my life? So when someone inquires, I can say, man, I can tell you, there was a point in my life, this was true. But then I had this life-changing moment. 
because of this or because of this, I came face to face with the person of Jesus Christ and I experienced for the first time in my life forgiveness and hope. And man, since that time, my life has been, and, and very quickly, you can just share your story. But I think that's what Mary was doing. She was pondering all of this stuff. So, so the birth of, of the Christ child has just taken place and then Luke goes on to give us another little snapshot of Jesus, the child. Jesus, the boy. In, in verse 21, down through about 51, and we're not going to take the time to read it, but I encourage you to do it and see the progression that Luke is giving to us. Because this is really about the only place I found in Scripture that I see this laid out. Now, you have to remember that Luke is a physician, he's a historian, and he's a follower of Jesus. So, as a physician, as a historian, as a follower of Jesus, he is fully aware of both the physical and the spiritual development and growth process of people. I want you to know that as a physical person and a spiritual person, you are in a growth process in both of those areas in your life. It's exactly what we see with Jesus. So, Mary and Joseph, uh, let me just say this, we're, we're not randomly selected, right? We know that they were chosen by God. And I love because the fact that they were chosen by God, that, that we see them now walking in obedience to Christ after the birth of Jesus. Because look, look what Luke tells us. In, in 138, uh, Mary had said, hey, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. So all the nativity took place. And throughout his growth process, then Joseph and Mary are walking in obedience. And, and we see some simple little things, right? They, at the eighth day, they took Jesus to the temple to be circumcised because that was Jewish law. That was tradition according to Genesis 17 and Leviticus 12. On the eighth day, they would take the male child and have him circumcised. And at that point, they would declare a name. What did they name him? Yeah, this is a Sunday school quiz, right? They named him what? You knew it was either Jesus, Moses, or, you know, something, right? I mean, they named him Jesus. Of course they did because that's what they were told. And they were obedient to Christ. Mary observed then, Luke tells us, 40 days, right, of, of purification, uh, again, this was Old Testament law, Leviticus chapter 12, that after a woman would give birth, God gave her a period of rest, right? Seclusion to, to rest and be restored. It was called 40 days of purification. And, and Mary experienced that, and she just stepped back with Jesus in a relationship with God. And then at the end of that period of time, look what they did. They, they then brought Joseph, or Joseph and Mary, brought Jesus to the temple to present him to the Lord. Why did they do that at 40 days? Because that's what they were instructed to do in the Old Testament. And so in faithfulness to God, the firstborn son of a woman was brought to the temple and presented to God as an offering. God, thank you for this gift of a child, going, going all the way back to the Passover. So they were obedient to the Lord and they brought Jesus at 40 days old and, and presented him to the Lord. And, and that required a sacrifice. So what did they do? They brought a sacrifice because that's what the Lord asked them to do. And according to Old Testament law, uh, it could have been a lamb or two turtle doves or two pigeons based on the position um, societally of the individual. And according to Luke, he doesn't say anything about the lamb. He only mentions the two pigeons or two turtle dove, which tells us something about Mary and Joseph's position in society. Not wealthy enough to bring the lamb, but they brought in faithful obedience to the Lord two turtle dove or two pigeon. Why? Is a sacrifice to the Lord saying, God, thank you. Thank you for your goodness, right? She's treasuring, she's pondering, she's putting it all together. She's seeing the faithfulness of God and in gratitude, she's saying, thank you for what you have done for us. Luke goes on to record that Mary and Joseph are coming back to Jerusalem regularly for the feast of the Passover because verse 42 tells us when Jesus was 12 years old, they were back for the feast of the Passover. That's when Jesus stayed, mom and dad left, Three days later, hey, where's, where's Jesus? Anybody else have that moment with their kids? It's like, wait, I'm a parent. Where's my child right now? Wait, am I the only one in the room that's, I'm the only one that's done that, right? Come on, seriously, anybody leave a child somewhere? Okay, thank you for not making me feel totally alone. But in obedience, they, they were coming back to Jerusalem and they were celebrating the feast of the Passover. And, and verse 42 says Jesus was 12 years old. 
And they lost track of him. Where was he? We know this. He was at the temple. Well, was he teaching or being taught? Yes. <laughs> right? Yes, he's having, as a 12-year-old, he's having these encounters with the priest, and, and they're astounded at his wisdom and his understanding. But I don't think it's an accident that Luke chapter 2, verse 39, look at it. It says, and when they, that's speaking of Mary and Joseph, had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. When Mary and Joseph were fully obedient to all the things that God had commanded them, they returned. Can I tell you this? Parents, listen to me. Look, parent, if you're a parent in the room, look at me. The greatest thing you can do for your child is to walk in faithfulness and obedience to Jesus. You're going to mess up as a parent, I promise you. You're going to overreact. You're going to underreact. You're going to lose track of things. You're, your life's going to be out of control. Listen to me. Walk faithfully and obediently with Jesus. That's the greatest thing you can do for your child. I certainly thought someone would say amen right there, but thank you. Amen? Walk faithfully and obediently. Now, I love this because the very next verse, verse 40, and the child, speaking of Jesus, grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Jesus grew. He became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. And so that's, what, that's the picture from 21 down through 51 is this, this picture of Jesus growing. He's growing. And then look in verse 51. Because again, you see this progression. Here it is. Jesus is roughly 12 years old. And in verse 51, we have this phrase again that Luke shares with us. And his mother, that's Jesus' mother, this is Mary, treasured up all these things in her heart. The same phrase that was used in, in chapter 2, verse 19 about the infant Jesus is now used about the boy Jesus. Something happens between birth and 12, right? You have some new experiences. New things are taking place. There's, there's new activities going on in our house. Mary's treasuring up all these things. I can't imagine all that has taken place with, with eight-year-old Jesus and nine-year-old Jesus and 10-year-old Jesus and now 12-year-old Jesus who, who left the caravan and stayed in the temple for three days teaching and, and all the, the priests were astounded at him. And so here's Mary at little Jesus at 12 just treasuring up all these things, putting them together like a jigsaw puzzle. God, what are you doing? And I'm sure she's having those moments of saying, this was not how I expected my life to go. Uh, maybe I somehow thought that Jesus miraculously would skip all these hard years and just go be Messiah and save the world. But I'm still raising this boy. When I look at this, I, I, I just love this. Because this just speaks to real life. But then Luke jumps on, and we're going to come back and, and tie this together. But, but Luke goes on because in verse 52 then, right after Mary treasured up all these things in her heart, verse 52, look what it says. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. I think there's a time shift that takes place right here. Between 51 and 52 I think there's a time shift that takes place. Everything happened up to, to 52. Mary is treasuring these things. And, and I think, I really do believe, and I'll tell you why in just a moment. I think there's a shift because Mary is treasuring up all these things about her child, Jesus, her boy, Jesus. But I think 52, Luke changes the, the discourse of his letter because I believe now he's talking about Jesus the man. He's talking about Jesus, the man. Now, it's interesting because when I look at this, you look at verse 40, it's talking about Jesus growing, and you talk about 52, and it's talking about Jesus growing. But, but each of these have an imperfect tense, which emphasizes it's ongoing, it's continual, and it's a progression. In other words, uh, Paul or, or Luke could have literally taken um, the translation. He could have said in verse 40, because the rough translation would basically say, uh, hey, and he got bigger. <laughs> Baby Jesus that we knew in the manger is getting bigger. 
Uh, verse 40 implies that there was really, it was sort of passive. In other words, Jesus didn't really have much to do with what was taking place in his physical body. Parents, have you ever had that moment of just going, oh, my babies are growing too fast. I just want them to slow down. No, you don't. Okay? You really don't. You want them to grow. That's what God created them to do. You want them to grow. And, and what Luke is saying is, sweet little baby Jesus, no crying he makes. Well, he did because he was a baby, right? I mean, sounds great in the song, but we know he was a baby. He did everything a baby did. And, and as a baby, he grew. He got bigger. Biology was doing what God created it to do. Baby Jesus was getting bigger. But, but there's this, this passive process that, that physically Jesus is getting bigger. But Paul almost paints kind of a before and after, right? Uh, the before process of, of boy Jesus to now man Jesus. Because in verse 52, his choice of verbs means to advance, to make headway, to uh, forge ahead. So I, I think there's a, a shift right there between Mary pondering everything that took place in the life of her boy to now Luke saying Jesus as a man grew in favor and, and he made headway, he advanced, he forged ahead because I believe it was after that event uh, in Jesus' childhood that Luke shows Jesus actively participating in his own maturing process. Th there's a point at which you and I have to come to that place of saying, I cannot inherit my faith, I have to own it for myself. I had a dad who deeply loved Jesus, and there came a point in my life as a young man that I had to say, I can't be a godly man simply because my father was a godly man. I had to choose to forge ahead. I had to choose to, to step up and own my faith, and that's true for every single one of us in this room. We have to own our faith. We have to choose to make headway and to grow, and so Luke portrays him as actively participating in his own maturing process. Uh, after his time with the, with the professors, the teachers in the temple, Jesus emerged, I believe, fully aware of his identity and his purpose. And he was a different young man. So in between this passive getting bigger and the active forging ahead, we actually see it in Luke's vocabulary. Because you could grab your Bible and just, just run through there. Uh, I just sort of marked them in my Bible because there's several different words. There's at least four, five different words that are used for the child Jesus. Uh, you can move from being an, uh, a newborn to, uh, in verse 34, he's referred to as a child uh, it's a different Greek word the, than that is that is used later. Um, Mary, in, in verse 43, uses the word technon, which literally means a descendant or a prodigy. Um, in verse 43, they use the word boy. It's a different word than the word child. In other words, Luke is simply saying that Jesus is growing. He's doing all the things that he's supposed to do. But then it's interesting because in verse 52, when Luke is speaking of Jesus, there is no pre-qualifying statement of who he is. He didn't say the boy Jesus, the child Jesus, the teen Jesus. He identified him in his true character and his true name, and he said, Jesus grew in wisdom and in knowledge and favor with God and man. He, he was a man. And so here, here's, here's why I think part of this happened, right? Jesus did all the things. He gained weight. He learned manners. He was taught to read. He did all those things. But in verse 52, when he said, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man, I believe that was the pivotal point. I believe at this point, Luke is referring to Jesus as a 30-year-old man. And here, here's why I think that. Because as Luke continues to write, the very next thing we have from Luke is talking about John the Baptist. And so John the Baptist is baptizing. He's talking about John's ministry. He talks about Jesus now coming to John to be baptized. So I think that, that's why I think there's a time warp. I think there's a gap right there. Because when you go and right on the heels of that, right on the heels of him being baptized, look at verse 23 of, of Luke chapter 3. He says, Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age. Can I just say that's not a coincidence? That's not an accident from Luke? Because according to Old Testament Scripture, Numbers chapter 4, it was at the age of 30 that a young man could serve as a priest in the temple. In other words, he could do ministry. 
It was also at the age of 30 that the Jews considered uh, a young man fully mature. No accident. No accident with God. There was no accident that the census was going to take place. There was no accident that there was no room in the inn. There was no accident that, that the angels appeared to the shepherds. There was no accident taking place. And I don't think there was an accident in Jesus' life. But Jesus chose at that point to become the man that God created him to be. He chose to step up and accept the responsibility that God has given him. Some of you in this room and online today need to step up. You need to say, I've been hanging out with Jesus long enough as a child, as, a, as an infant, but now as an adult, I need to step up and I need to forge ahead. I need to own my impact and, and forge ahead as a child of God. You see, Luke says that Jesus increased in wisdom and in knowledge and in stature. Jesus was not simply waiting for more. Jesus chose to become more. He chose to advance, to make headway, and to forge ahead to accept the responsibility of ministry that God has given him. I think we can learn a lot from that this morning. That's exactly what he did with others. When, when he called the disciples to him uh, as he began his ministry, do you remember what he did? His first invitation to his disciples was what? Come and follow me, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Get this, with Jesus' invitation came a description. Jesus invited, come and follow me, that's the invitation. The description was, I'm going to make you something. There is no following Jesus without the making of something. You, you can't just choose to follow Jesus without him making you into the very thing he wants you to be because that's what Jesus demonstrated for us. He says, come and follow me and I'm gonna make you something. And this is a very practical moment in the life of Jesus because he's saying, look, I wanna do something intentionally and purposefully in the life of these men. I'm gonna take 12 men for three years and radically change the world. In order to do that, I'm gonna show the world, I'm gonna show my church what it is to both grow physically and to grow spiritually. Because there's an implied progression of growth that Jesus is showing us in both of these areas. Uh, to me, and this is just kind of a side note, if you want a great read this year uh, on the spiritual growth and development, the maturity stages of Christian development, I highly recommend this book by Jim Putman called Real Life Discipleship. He wrote this in 2010. I was pastoring a church and I dove into it. And for me personally, it radically changed uh, my interaction, my discipleship with other people because God helped me begin to see where people are in their growth process. I was a younger dad at that point in time, realizing that even, even how I parent my children is to understand where they are in the growth process. How I interact with other people in my small group or in church or young men that I'm discipling, older men than me that I'm discipling, that, that I begin to understand where are they in their spiritual growth process, not just their physical growth process. Because one of the things that God taught me in this moment several years ago is that you can grow old in Christ, but never grow up in Christ. Do you see the difference? And just speaking from personal experience, I came to know Christ as a young boy, but I didn't grow up in Christ. I grew older in Christ. I knew Jesus, but I didn't start growing up in Christ. Matter of fact, two guys in my life that deeply impacted and affected my walk with Jesus Christ knew Jesus less time than me. And I'm telling you what, when, when I started putting this stuff together, God really started to challenge me and say, Dave, it doesn't matter how long you know me. The question is, how are you growing up in me? And these guys, one guy that had literally known Christ like four or five years, and I'd known Jesus like 15, 20 years. But, but this guy, man, he had matured well past where I was, and he really began to impact my life. And, and so I, I highly encourage you to just begin to understand the growth stages of, of where we are physically and spiritually to help others grow in Christ. Because I believe this is at the very heart and mission of Jesus' ministry and at the very heart of what we do at Southbridge. Jesus very intentionally, very purposefully, get this, took 12 guys for three years and radically changed the world. 
get, get, the, get the math here for a moment. Jesus, not, not that he didn't have impact with, we know he'd fed 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 people. We, we know that Jesus dealt with crowds, but where was his investment? He didn't build a church. He, he didn't like build a building and start hosting lots of things. Jesus took 12 guys intentionally, said, you come and follow me and I'm going to make you what I want you to be. And he took those 12 guys for three years and that's why we're sitting here today. I've been part of church life for a long time. It's like, well, let's get bigger, let's get bigger, let's get bigger. But, but there's no spiritual growth. There's no progression of growth spiritually. And I think what we learn from Jesus is his methodology. What Jesus modeled for us, he meant for us. If we're going to have the impact of Jesus, we're not going to have the impact of Jesus without the methodology of Jesus. And we have to learn to be intentional, to pour our life into one another, intentionally going through that process of growth to help one another reach spiritual maturity and begin to multiply. Paul understood this principle. Paul understood it when he talked to young Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. Paul was writing to Timothy and he said, Timothy, the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust also to reliable men who will in turn be able to teach others. Do, do you hear the multiplication? Paul to Timothy, Timothy to reliable men, reliable men to others, an implied minimum four generations. Let me ask you a question. Who's your Timothy. Let me back up. Who's your Paul? <laughs> I've said for, for all the years that God has dropped me in ministry, I've discovered everybody needs a Paul, everybody needs a Timothy. I've known a lot of great Pauls in my life. I still have men who serve as a Paul in my life, pouring their life into me, challenging me, pushing me spiritually. I have Timothys in my life. Some of them are pastoring churches. Some are working as insurance agent guys that I've poured my life into. I got one young guy, he's a, he's a barber and a part-time uh, worship pastor with a church. Had the privilege of pouring my life into him. And I love watching him pour his life into others who are now pouring their lives into others. It's an exciting thing and there is no more exciting thing in the gospel ministry than to see ministry multiplied in the lives of other people. Nothing. Seeing lives changed and transformed. So I want to ask a few questions this morning as we close. And I trust that these are both challenging and encouraging to you, but I want it to be really practical. And this is, these are literally, all I'm going to do is I'm going to read you the questions that are on the back of this week's small group study guide. You can get it uh, on the church website right now. Uh, if you get the weekly email, it wasn't in there this week, but you can go to the church website. It's usually in there. Just watch for that every week. Uh, but just go to the church website or we can email it to you, contact us. Uh, but as we walk through a spiritual progression of growth, there, there's a parallel process between how we grow physically and how we grow spiritually. As a matter of fact, Jesus clearly gives us uh, teaching in Scripture, and we understand that, that before we come to know Christ, the Bible says that you and I are dead in our trespasses and sin. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death. It means separation. We're separated from God until we first come to know Him. And, and, and Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, I love this, He says, Talking to a very religious guy, he said, hey, what must I do to see the kingdom of God? Jesus said, you must be born again. In other words, you have to move from death to life. You need a brand new life in Jesus. And, and so what the Bible teaches us is that basically anytime someone comes to know Jesus, no matter how old you are, you're an infant in Jesus. You are born again. You're brand new. If you've ever held a baby, you understand what a baby needs from you. What do they need? Everything, Right? Feed me, clean me, change me. Then feed me again. Then change me again and clean me again. I mean, it's like, but they need everything from us. So for, for people who are new in Jesus Christ, we have a responsibility to accept them and love them and care for them in every possible way as an infant in Jesus to help them grow. But th then you move past the infancy stage and you begin to, to move into childhood stage. Ultimately from childhood into young adult and into adulthood and so there's, there's stages all along the way, and I will simply tell you, none of us stop growing. There, there's no one who arrives and go, I'm done. We're all growing, and we all have places we can grow. So I hope these questions simply help you say, what is my next step? What, what, what's my next step? When I leave here today, what do I need to do? How do I need to grow? 
They're broken into three sections. Here you go. Are you ready? They're going to run up here, but you can get the, the sheet. It'd be a lot easier. As a spiritual infant, if you're relatively new in Christ, if you come to know Christ recently, or you just, you've never really experienced life change and growth, these questions may help you. Do you enjoy your relationship with God? I mean, seriously, do you enjoy it or is it just a religion? Is it an obligation? Is it, you know, or, or I mean, do you enjoy it? Are you noticing life change taking place? Because Jesus always brings life change. Are you spending time regularly in his word, allowing him to teach you? Now, again, this is personal, right? I'm not saying, are you going to church? Or are you sitting in some kind of a, a small group or Bible study? But are you spending time in God's word? That's why we want you to have Hebrews as we start next week. You read God's word. Let God teach you. Do you need to invite someone or who do you need to invite to come alongside you and help you grow in your growth journey? See, in other words, as, as a younger believer, you might just need to, to ask someone to say, hey, would you help me grow? Would you be the one that steps into my life and kind of helps me grow through some of this stuff? That's okay. As a spiritual child or a young adult, the section, second section, how is your prayer life? You see, if prayer is simply conversation with God, do you talk? To him, do you talk at him or do you talk to him and do you listen, right? If a conversation is two-way, you have to speak, but you also have to listen. Uh, the question, what is Jesus making you? Uh, are you becoming a fisher of men? Do, do you see what God is developing? Do you see how you're growing? This question is very compelling. When was the last time you shared your personal faith in Jesus with another person? I think that speaks to a lot of heart of every believer when we can honestly say, when was the last time I shared my faith with another person? Uh, and, and maybe you double back and begin to write your story this year. Are you confident and equipped enough to do that? Would you commit this year to grow in that area and ask God to give you gospel opportunities to share with others? I'm telling you, this is bold. If you want to grow, this is a bold step because Opportunities are there where you just don't, we're not aware. There's always opportunities. God is more than willing to give us opportunities because this is the very thing he said he will make us, fishers of men. And then last right there, are you learning to use your gifts to serve and reach others? And then some questions for some of us that have been around the church a little bit longer, maybe pushes us a little bit more. Here's a couple of questions for you. Are you purposefully and intentionally growing in Christ in difficult areas? And by that, I simply mean stuff outside the, the church norm, hard areas of life, private areas of life. Do you have men that are holding you accountable, that are pushing you to grow in some of those areas that you've avoided probably most of your Christian life? They get hard. They get difficult. Second, have you fully embraced the mission of Jesus to make disciple-making disciples? That's what Jesus invited us to. And I think as mature believers, until we embrace that mission, we're never going to fully enjoy all that God has in store for us. Are you learning to lead and invest in the lives of others? And then lastly, by faith, are you willing, just like Jesus, to invite others to come alongside you so that you can disciple them intentionally, helping them grow toward spiritual maturity in Christ? I hope you have something to chew on right there because that's a lot. But here's what I want to encourage you. No two people in this room are at the same space. And your next step with Jesus is not going to look like someone else's. So I simply ask you to pray and say, God, what is my next step in my journey of growth with you? As I grow physically, God, I want to own my impact. I want to forge ahead. I want to grow with you intentionally. Help me understand what my next step is and how do I grow? Listen, folks, that's why we are here as a church, to help you do those things. Please don't hesitate just to reach out and say, well, y'all are busy and stuff. That's literally why we exist as a church, to connect people to Jesus for life change. But we can't connect if, if you, we don't know where you are. If you're online, you just need to reach out and let us know, how do we love you? How do we care for you? How do we help push you forward? If you're in the room, maybe you're not connected with other people and, and Christian community and you're not growing, we need to help you, but we need to know. So please just reach out.
But just for a moment, I'm going to ask you all through the room and online just to bow your heads in an attitude of prayer. I want you to ponder and treasure these questions for just a moment. Would you do that? God, what is my next step in my journey? God, how do you want me to grow this year as we start into this new year? God, I do not want my life to be the same. I want to step up. I want to forge ahead. I want to own my impact. I want to embrace the mission to which you've called me. Lord, give me wisdom. Give me understanding. If you're online or you're in this place, please let us know. Just reach out, catch us. Let's get you connected. Let's help you grow to take your next step in your journey with Jesus. Father, thank you for hearing our prayers. Thanks for knowing our hearts and giving us clear next steps. We love you. We praise you for being a great, mighty, and faithful God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining our sermons online. We hope to see you in person soon. Our location and service times can be found at our website, sfchurch.com. If God has stirred your heart today and you'd like someone to pray with, or if you'd like more information about Jesus, please take a moment and email us at info at sfchurch.com. Thank you again. God bless.